Hello and welcome to another episode of Menal's World. This is episode 29 with Jasvinder Sanghera, CBE. And she's a survivor of forced marriage. And she left home at a very young age and, and had to find a life that she felt happy with because she refused to live the life that was chosen for her or the life that her parents had decided for her. Uh, she ran away from forced marriage because she saw her sister's go through something very similar and she decided that she did not want that in her life. I mean, I talk about it as if it's a fairy tale ending, but it it isn't. And when you listen to the story, just when there is now in her 50s and she ran away from home at the age of 16 and she's still campaigning, she's still working with politicians and with change makers as a campaigner to make sure that this actually becomes illegal and to make sure that other women don't have to go through this and to see how she turned her life around, how she used her experience to create change on a national level and an international level is so inspiring. And I don't want to go on about her because if I do, I could spend hours doing that. <laughs> but Jasvinder is is an amazing woman. And, you know, speaking to her on on Tuesday... I have to say, I was very nervous. I didn't sleep the night before because I wanted to make sure that I got everything right because she's such a such an important figure in our society and someone I've looked up to for, for so many years to have her in front of me. And she was so warm and so just like everything just flew, like was flowing so naturally that I didn't have to like hesitate or, or worry about anything because I really felt a connection with her. And that connection was that we just want to share our stories because we know it will help other people. So without further ado, it's the one and only Jasvinder Sanghera. Jasvinder, thank you for joining me today on, on the podcast. I know I interviewed you three years ago and it seems like a world away after going through COVID. It feels like we just lived a completely different life back then. Yeah, indeed. Absolutely. <laughs> and obviously things have changed in my world since then as well. Yeah. yeah. And I asked, I've been asking my guests every week that I've had over the last few months, yeah. what's the pandemic been like for you? I think for me, the big difficulty has been not connecting with my grandchildren mm. and my children. My daughter gave birth to a little boy and he's five months old and um, really missed that connection and the whole thing with the delivery for her because she's on her own. Um, that was quite difficult because of maternity wards and, you know, not yeah. being able to be on the wards, all that kind of stuff. Um, other than that, I've got quite used to working from home and I have found myself busier, actually, mm. because I think when you're in the world of virtual world, you're making more connections and also you are making sure you don't miss out because you haven't got the physical connections either. Mm. And and I'm right in the middle of writing as well. So there's been more time to write because there's not so much of the traveling and the commuting. Yeah. So so you're writing your next book, just in there? I am sketching notes, should I say? Okay. Yes, I am. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I won't I won't give away t- too much. Yeah. I'll let that be a surprise for, That's for everybody. Fine. That's fine. <laughs> um just Vinder, your your story is is incredible and it, and it's so unique. Um and it, it's empowered me uh, personally over the last few years. And I did interview you three years ago. Mm. And, you know, there, there are times where I'm having a, a rubbish day and I try to find some inspiration. And your episode is one I always go back to because oh. you, okay. you've you seen you've seen a lot of crap, just been, <laughs> to put it in simple <laughs> terms. And um, if we just go back back to the beginning, your yeah. your father had moved to, to the UK from from Punjab from yeah. rural Punjab, and uh-huh. he he built his family here in the UK. And mm-hmm. uh, if I'm not, if I'm correct, you you're one of seven, right? Yeah, yeah. So, one so you had you had men, yeah. So you you had sisters, and you had one brother. Mm-hmm. Now, before we go into the conversation about forced marriage um, mm-hmm. and the kind of life you led, mm-hmm. what was the relationship like between your parents and your brother, and how different was that between the girls and and the one brother that you had? So the relationship between my brother and us and my parents, I realised was a very different one from a very, very young age, as young as five years old, actually, Um, because my brother was allowed to be fed before us. So, you know, when when dinner was made and roti was made, you know, he, we would be serving him first. Um, And then he was also allowed to go out with his friends and he was allowed presents such as a bike you know and um, 
his world was very different. And as I got older, I saw the starker differences because, you know, he was allowed to date and he's allowed to go out with his friends. He could express himself in what he wore. Um, he could have white friends and we were prevented from integrating. And he also went to a better school than us, actually. Um, wow. And so you could see he could answer back. He could order us around, you know, get us this, get us that. And he didn't take part in any of the housework or the cooking or the cleaning. My mother literally treated him like a mini god. And, you know, mm. anything he wanted, he would have. You would say he was spoiled. And clearly he was. And even when it yeah. came to marriage, you know, he married out of choice. Whereas none of the sisters, none of us were allowed to marry out of choice. And he, in fact, married somebody who was dual heritage. So she was half white and half Indian. And again, my mother accepted that. Mm. And you said that you noticed it from a young age of five. And I've started to notice this as well. I mean, my my daughter is only three months old. She's very young, but I still feel like she can sense what's going on around her. Um, She can sense um, happiness and sadness. And at the age of five, What were you seeing and did you speak up from that young age or did that only come a bit later? I absolutely didn't speak up at that young age, no. Um, But certainly at the age of five, you could see that my brother was treated differently in that he was served upon and taken care of in a better way than what we were as young girls. And, you know, um, my mother certainly gave him more attention than what she gave us and you could you could see you know at five six you know by that age we were already learning how to make roti so you know <laughs> wow yeah so it was like yeah. you know I've never seen my brother wash a single pot in his life or cook over the stove or anything like that you know if, he, if he'd eaten at five we would be I, I I can even remember now going over to get his plates and take them to the sink and wash them, you know. He would never wow. lift a finger. And also I remember when we lived in our very first house, which was a terraced house, it was two up, two down, so two bedrooms, one bathroom, downstairs a, a front room, living room and a kitchen. You know, he had his own bed, whereas me and my sisters had to sleep two at one end of the bed and two at the other end of the bed. You know, that was from when we were tiny, you know, and he had his own room. Mm. So, yeah. But just when you know, it seemed like you were living in this bubble of of your family. And Uh because you were prevented to to speak to other other people and to to have that social interaction. Yeah. um, What made you notice these differences? Was it um, any interactions you had in school or was it TV or there must have been something for you to say, actually, hang on, something's not right here. I think. The first thing to say is the outside world looking in may see this as a bubble, but this was our normality. So this was very Mm. normal. You know, you don't know something is different until it's pointed out to you as different or you feel difference. And for me, the biggest thing that I noticed was the difference between my peers at school and me in terms of their life, you know, the way they dressed. They didn't dress modestly as we were expected to. They had the latest fashion with their hair compared to what we were allowed to or not allowed to cut our hair. We were told it was against our religion or our tradition or our Mm. culture. Um, Not being allowed to go to the school disco or outings and things like that, whereas they could. They were the first kind of things I noticed. Um, And trying to ask if we could do those things, which I did, you know, you were told very clearly, no, that's shameful. You know, that's disrespectful. Now, our girls don't do that. And then I think for me personally, the biggest thing I believe that made me question why my life was different was when I watched my sisters marry before me. And I think my age has a lot to do with it because I have one sister younger than me. And then my family is married in order of age. So I watched my sisters' marriages. And they were all, every single one was an unhappy marriage where they experienced domestic abuse as well. And I didn't want that for me. I believed you get married, you go, your family leave you. And even if you're unhappy, nobody comes to rescue you. So for me, I didn't want that. And that was the biggest thing that made me question everything. You see, Mm. if my parents had accepted me saying no I probably would have still been with my family 
I just did not want to marry a stranger and I didn't want to be in a marriage where you get hurt and nobody helps you. So that's when I mm. really started to question things. And just in, there, in, in one of your TED Talks, you'd mentioned that uh, from a very young age of, of eight, yeah. you know, your family were already looking for a suitor or, or yeah. a potential husband for you. Yeah. And were these relationships found within your own community or uh to put it uh, more, you know, to, to even go into more detail, were they sort of distant relatives or was it just anybody in in, in and around uh, your, your society? So we, my family were a Sikh family. Um, so they did not practice first cousin marriage as yeah. they do in, in Muslim communities, for example. So the way they have like the arranger, the fixer, the person, the pajolla, we mm. call it in Punjabi, mm. that finds somebody. Um, it can be word of mouth within relatives, amongst relatives. But for me and all my sisters, it was always somebody from India. So it would be okay. it would be somebody that my family knew, a family in India, their family. And then it would be them identifying somebody and then that person would be chosen for us. And I was promised to somebody when I was eight, but I didn't know that until I was 14 years old. And when you say promise to someone at the age of eight, what yeah. was what kind of process does that involve? Um, obviously, the families must talk, but is there any yeah. other step that's taken from there? No, the, the biggest thing is that the families will talk amongst the families and the intended person's family. And if they give their word, that's a promise. So that word is a promise, which is right. why when I left home, because that promise of marriage had been made and it would have been complete shameful not to honour that promise of marriage because my family have given their word. My mother's given her word. And I say my mother because she was the key influencer, the key person that did all the arranging. My younger sister was forced to marry that man because a promise had been made. So they had to honour that promise. Wow. And there's this, this word that we use quite a lot in, in our society. We, we, we talk about izzat all yeah. the time. Yeah. And that's something that I'm sure your mother was, was always concerned about, you know, the respect of the family and the, the dignity mm -hmm. um, of, of your, your parents as well. But just Finder, you decided to, to, to run away from all this, to completely distance yourself from this life that was coming your way. Mm -hmm. You decided that I am not going to be a part of this. And you ran away from home because you were essentially locked up um, mm -hmm. because they, they wanted you to marry this guy. And, you know, you, you have mentioned before that people would just bring you food outside the door mm -hmm. and you would just eat it. And then if you needed to go to the bathroom, that's the only time these doors would open. Mm -hmm. Now, you ran away from home and... At that young age, just been there, you don't know what's outside in the bigger world because mm. to some extent you were sheltered. Yeah. So how did you gather up the courage and, and what made you make that like decision to say, I've had enough? For me, um, the thing that made me protest to the point where I said, I'm not marrying this stranger, was the fact that my family didn't listen. My mother my father, you know, my, the thing about turning down a marriage arrangement is that those people within your family collude and they gang up on you. So everybody gangs up on you and you become the, the bad guy, as it were. Um, and because they didn't listen, I even attempted suicide and that didn't change anything. I was at a point where I knew that I was desperate and it came to the point where you're either marrying this man or something has to change. And that was the point where um, had in, what can I say, um, begged and pleaded, nobody's listening. In fact, it just made it harder for me. I decided to agree to plan my escape because I believed if I ran away from home, that might make them see sense. That might really make them see. See, I never ran away from home with the intention of staying away from home, my intention was to leave to make them see that I really don't want to marry. What more can I do to show you that I don't want to marry this man? Um, so I ran away and, you know, it's well documented. Somebody helped me to run away from home, just he did. And I thought in time, my mother will say, it's okay, you can come back. So weeks pass and, you know, I was homeless then. We were homeless. We slept in the car. You know, we were washing our faces in public conveniences. We we lived a life just on the run because there was a real fear 
that I'm going to get tracked down by my family, who clearly did report me missing to the police. So in a sense, I in those first few weeks, I was waiting for the dust to settle for them to say, it's okay, you can make your point and you can come back. Um, and that was the, the 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 day of the fateful phone call home to my mother. And that was when she made it clear that I could only come back if I married that man or I would be in their eyes and from this day forward dead in their eyes. Just in there, I remember three years ago when we, we mm. had a similar conversation, you mentioned that yeah. your mother had... Um, in some sort of way, mentally abused you in that phone call. Um, mm. She, what, what else did she say to you? She must have, she must have said some horrible things to you because she must have been really angry at that point. Yeah, she was. I mean, I can remember the phone call um, as if it were this morning. You know, I could recall it mm. to you completely for word for word. Well, you have to remember that I was ringing with hope. I was ringing with desperation and the hope to hear, okay, you've made your point, come back. And what came back was vitriol. It was anger at me. You know, you have done this to your family. You know, people spit at me when they see me in the street. You know, I hope you give birth to a daughter who does to you what you have done to me. Then you'll know what it feels like to raise the prostitute. And and I'm there at the other end of the phone saying, Mum, but I'm only just 16. I want to come home, but I won't marry that man. Please, Mum, please. Trying to get her to see sense. And she just came back with more vitriol and was very clear that I will not accept you unless you come back and marry this man and conform to a life that deprives a woman of freedom, rights, independence. That's an honour system. You know, or she said, she just wished so much ill on me. You know, you will amount to nothing. You know, you will be in the streets and rolling around yourself and you know, to think of a mother wishing that upon their own child and, in fact, letting you know that you are nothing now. And then the phone went down and that was it. Um, so, in a way, she'd set me up to fail. It was this sense of you're never going to amount to anything and this was their expectation of me. And also, you don't have your family. And I always say to people, it's like waking up tomorrow morning and imagining never seeing a member of your family or your familiar surroundings ever again and being made to feel that it was your fault also. That's the choice, which is why many victims go back to the family. You know, it takes courage to go back too, I acknowledge that. But some mm. don't, and then you live a life. Um, in the first, from 16 to 19, I described my world as um, I was severely depressed and living in a room with the curtains drawn, you know, and that's how it felt to me, you know, and I was being piled with antidepressants and, you know, I felt numb. I became um, claustrophobic, agoraphobic. I had all these sorts of trauma is one of, it was traumatic. I had a traumatic experience, you know, the triggers from trauma are very real, you know, you mm. and you, you experience PTSD, it's all there. And in that space, I was also missing my family. You know, I was craving their acceptance, craving their love, ringing them for the phone to go down, going to the house for them to tell me to go away. You know, that missing, that big void that happens in your world is something that can never get filled. Just Vindu, your mother was obviously very, very angry and yeah. resentful to, to what you had done. Mm. She was, seems like she was stuck between Izzat and yeah. the love for her daughter. Mm -hmm. Throughout your childhood, just Vindu, did you ever at any point, were there times where you felt that motherly love from her? Or was it always a very distant relationship? Was it always a case of, I just have to obey her, her rules and just get on with, with the house rules? I think... There are rare occasions when I saw a soft side to my mother. You know, she cooked for us, cleaned for us. The house was clean. It was a warm house. You know, it wasn't a cruel house. You know, we were raised within a an environment that, for me, was our family home, a loving house. It was when it, you know, and the kind of norms of you can't speak to these people, you have to dress like this, you're not allowed to look at men and make eye contact, we don't cut our hair. 
it was all normal to me because it was the sense of conditioning and grooming and it was rooted in this is us this is our way this is our culture this is our religion this is our tradition now when your parents are telling you this you believe them you know you learn your rights and wrongs from your key carers so why would i disbelieve them you know and for me it was just parenting until we got older and that was when it changed because as you got older into your teenage years that's when you understood if you went against any of those rules that's when you faced a physical punishment you know or an emotional punishment um so i can't say and I'm not sure if that generation ever did express their love in the same way we do towards our children today. Um, it was just her way. But sometimes it was a softness to her. So, for example, my mother used to work and she'd come home and she used to carry this bag with her. and We'd all dive on this bag looking for sweets and she'd laugh. And, you know, she'd make us our favourite um, dal that we wanted to eat or, you know, sorry, somebody's just waving at me <laughs> at the window. <laughs> um and, uh, you know, there were little soft moments that I remember. Um, but my mother never had any one of her daughters ever stand up to her. Remember, I was the first, you know. Mm. she. So her expectation was that they all married without question. So she would have been surprised that here was a daughter saying, no, I'm not doing this. Um, and then it was later on in my life when my mother had a secret relationship with me, you know, when she got cancer, that's when I really did see a softer side of my mother and I did feel a genuine love. And I don't know if it was because she was so helpless herself. You know, my mother had ovarian cancer and then bowel cancer and she became so weak, you just could carry her. And, you know, I remember bathing her and I remember caring for her and, when she was in the hospice, I remember having to go in the early hours of the morning when my family were not there or late at night when they're not there. And I remember once walking into the hospice room where you know, my mother was so thin. And, you know, remember, she was this formidable, strong woman. You know, you look at her and you see this strength about her. Her presence was known. But I remember walking to this room and she had this nighty on. And she sat in the corner of the room and the sun was shining through the window through her nighty as well. And as I walked in, there was this beaming smile on her face. And I remember walking in the room and you know, she's looking at me and I looked behind me and then I realised that the smile was for me. And I'd never felt that before and experienced that before. And it felt warm. It felt, you know, loving. It felt kind. And so we had those conversations me and my mother never talked about me leaving home ever we never talked about that you know there's some things we didn't talk about um never talked about Rabina committing suicide my sister which incidentally my mother became very ill shortly after Rabina's death um and that I remember as a time of almost as if my mother was saying to me you know that's that now you know this is me because I suppose when you're faced with the sharp sense of your own mortality you know, death is round the corner. You know, regret is a hard thing. And you cannot, my mother would never, ever say, look, I got that wrong. I wasn't expecting that. But she did it through how she was warmer towards me towards the end. Just finally, you had a very complicated relationship with your mother. And, yeah. you know, you speak about going to the hospice to care for her in, in, her, yeah. in the final, final days. Hmm. Did you feel that warmth again, that love for your mother? despite everything that she'd done to you? I think the one thing that listeners need to understand is, is that I've never, ever stopped loving my mother or my father, ever. There was never a time when I did ever, and I wasn't, I was hurt and there was pain. But equally, I rationalised this space by accepting that they were only doing what they thought was best. That doesn't make it right. And I forgave them a long time ago. Um, you know, uh, and I dedicated my first book to both of them, my mother and my father. Because, you know, I understood very quickly. We, we were raised to live our life according to what 
other people thought of us as a family, you know, the community, the neighbours, you know, our Asian community, you live your life. So your parents' reputation was intact, etc. So if my parents started to talk to me, those people would shun them. And they knew that. I knew that. If my, when my mother and father started to talk to me in secret, which is fine and I could accept that because at least I had some of them, I understood that if my brother and sisters knew they were talking to me or the, or people, other people, then for my parents, that would have been too much of a price to pay because those people may have stopped talking to them. And I understood mm. that. I understood the position they were putting themselves in. And, and I think, for that generation, remember their first generation, it is harder because you are asking them to break free from everything they've ever known. You know, they didn't live in England. You know, they arrived mm. here. <laughs> so, but, but it doesn't make it right. I'm not making excuses for what wrongs were done to me. But equally, part of my healing has been having to understand that. I think the, the empathy that you have for your parents is is, in, is incredible, just when there it takes a lot of um wisdom to to be able to 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 feel that way for someone who for for people who have to some extent hurt you quite quite a lot in your life. Mm. Now, a couple of things I want to go back to. Uh, firstly, just when there was your 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 sister Rubin who who got married before mm. you. Mm-hmm. Um, and after she got married, you have mentioned that after her marriage, she came back to the UK. She came yeah. back to school and she was wearing her wedding ring. Mm. At that point, didn't the schools or the, the education system or the teachers sort of ask what was going on? Because I understand that at that point, probably teachers were just a bit worried about um, stepping over a line because it is a cultural thing. Mm. Um, but did anybody question it? Did anybody raise a red flag around this at all? No, no, they didn't. And I have to question whether if that was to happen today, whether they would or not. Again, this is in 2020. Because don't forget, hmm. Rubina also had a nine, nine month absence from school that nobody questioned. So the wedding ring was one thing. The nine month absence from school and being put back into my year at school. So you know, we have two years between us. And because she missed so much school, she was put into my class. So we were, in effect, in the same class at school, but a different year. She's older than me. So none of these things were questioned or the fact that she looked different because she, you know, didn't wear Western dress again. So she had to wear traditional dress because obviously to my family, she's now somebody's wife, but they're not telling anybody that and you know my sister's been told not to sell you know these girls when they get married they're told not to mention it to anybody in the school so you don't so no those things were not questioned and albeit I can forgive my family my my parents for what happened to me I can I am I am angry still at how Rubina's death the suicide they were responsible for that to a certain degree, you know, because, and the community, I have to say, and I remember being thinking, you have blood on your hands because, you know, she was driven to commit suicide. She went for help to the community leader. She went for help to my parents, well, my mother. And she was told for the sake of the family's is of honour, she had to go back to this abusive man to make the marriage work. Now, for me... That is something that has nothing to do with generations, has nothing to do with the explanations I've just explained to you now. That is irresponsible to the degree that you took part in somebody taking their life. That's how I see that. And when she was back home with you, did you ever speak to her about her marriage? Did she ever... Because just I, I can't imagine it just in there. I mean, when I was a newlywed, mm. I I was so happy and I used to talk to everyone about, mm. about my marriage and my mm. wedding and... Obviously, that was a very different situation for for your sisters. Yeah. When she came back and she was at school with you, did you talk about her husband at all, or was she very silent about the life she was she was experiencing? You, you know, it's really interesting when I look at my sisters and when they came back, of which I can remember three of them, they were very excited about this man and now being married. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there was this photograph. 
put in the living room, you know, on the mantelpiece of their husband, and they'll be showing you this picture of this man and be excited. Let's not forget, they were being given permission for the first time in their life to think in a romantic way, you know, Mm. whereas before you're not allowed to. You know, they've had all this attention showered upon them by my mother and the family. You know, they are they're looked upon as, you know, well done. You know, you've done this. So they were in that space of almost romanticism and, you know, speaking to this man on the phone from India and writing letters and doing all that. And of course, all that helps the immigration application. But, you know, um, the point is, no, there wasn't the protest. And no, they'd become somebody's wife and we're very proud of it and we're waiting to go off and become that. Mm. Just Vinder, for between the age of 16 and 19, you said that you were away from home. Yeah. What were you doing for those three years and how were you surviving? Because I I remember my time in, in Czech Republic when I was studying medicine and that was six years away from home. Yeah. That was that was tough. That yeah. was very difficult. And I had family support. Yeah. Now I can't imagine being in a situation where I was where you were younger and you had no family support. What were you doing? Because at this point, Jasvinder, you had two options. One was to either go back mm. or to start your new life. And you chose the latter. So what were you doing at that time? Well, do you have to remember for the first year, 16, going to 17, I was almost putting my life on hold and hoping for my family to let me go home. So Jesse ran away with me. So his best friend, that my, be- my best friend, sorry, her brother said he would help me. We ran away. And now I'm with this person. And it is as if, well, this is the only person I have to actually help me in this big world that I'm not used to, actually. Mm. Um, and you're right. Our lives are so sheltered. We are incredibly vulnerable. You know, I, I didn't, I'd never had alcohol. I'd never kissed a boy before. I'd never been allowed to go to my hometown on my own or anything like that, you know. So money, how you handle that or anything. So Jesse, Jesse was very good. He he was older than me, not very much older, but quite a little bit older. And he'd saved up money. And I thought, well, this is where I have to be now with this person. And fortunate for me, he did not take advantage of my, of my vulnerability. You know, I, I say vulnerability is a gift in the hands of the person you choose to give it to. And mm. he was kind, you know, and and kind to the point where From 16 to 17, I was ill. I was missing my family. I was suffering depression to a high high degree. I attempted um, suicide by overdose again. This is the second time I did that. Um, And then by the time I got to 17, as we lived in bedsits and some really awful places, um, we went to Newcastle, then moved, couldn't find work there, moved across to West Yorkshire to to Leeds, to Bradford, and then we started to um, find jobs. So before we became market traders, which is what we ended up doing, um, I was doing all sorts of jobs, from cleaning to working in shops to doing various things, Um, and so was Jesse. And then I, um, at 19, when I became pregnant with my, my first daughter, Natasha, and she was born, and remember again, there are significant events in your life when you're disowned, where the missing becomes magnified and pregnancy is one of them. Birthdays, Christmas, you know, not having your mother as there as part of your pregnancy, you know. And also because I married just see in the end. And, and part of that for me, and it sounds awful because when people hear the story, they think it's Romeo and Juliet. We ran away together. It wasn't like that at all, <laughs> you know. Mm. Um, so... I, I thought maybe my parents will, I'll, I will have more respectability if I got married. Maybe they'll accept me if I got married. You know, um, maybe they'll accept me if I get educated. Maybe some, I'm on this tra- treadmill all the time of doing things in the hope that they will accept me. But of course, my mother never did because I'd married out of caste and he was a lower caste and et cetera. So when Natasha was born, For me, that was a big turning point because I finally understood the relationship between a mother, because I'm now a mother, and child and how it should actually be. 
because this child is totally dependent on you and there's nothing I would do to harm her, you know, from child to growing up. And and that's how it should be. So that that for me was a huge turning point in understanding the very concept of what unconditional love is, because I've never experienced that in my life. Hmm. Just think that when you were doing these jobs where you were cleaning and yeah. trying to sort of get by day by Survive. day, cash in hand sort of thing, mm. what, I mean, what was that thing that kept you going? Um, because it must have been something for you to say, actually, I keep going because this is the, the end goal. This is what I'm going to achieve. Was there something, mm. was there a voice in your head? To be honest, at that time when we were working in Joel sorts of jobs, that was more about survival. <laughs> that was more mm. about paying rents, um, paying bills. Um, you know, that was more about not going backwards, ending up into a, a worse bedsit than we had before. So for me, that initially that was survival. It didn't until we became market traders when I was like 18, 19. And I started to earn some money actually beyond survival as we became quite successful as business people. Um, did I start to start thinking differently in terms of I want to do something for me? You have to remember, I had not read a book until I was 28 years old. So, you know, I wasn't, I, let, I don't know what qualifications I had at school. So um, I started to shift my thinking in wanting to do things for me and not about acceptance of my family when I was around 24 and it was when Rabina died because that was when I thought what why am I putting my life on hold waiting for them to accept me you know why am I this is this has to be about me now I, I'm you know my daughter and that was when I started to invest in me and I started to um, educate myself and I became the campaigner that I am. Um, and I put myself through college and uni and et cetera. The rest is history. <laughs> mm. And just in there, you we spoke a lot about your, your mother. Uh, yeah. what was your relationship like with your father? Because you have mentioned that when you did run away, you left a, a note for, for your for your dad. My parents. What yeah. role did he play in your life? And was were you able to escape towards your father when your mother wasn't on your side? I think the biggest the hardest thing for me was that I love my dad dearly and we had a close relationship because dad would play with you and he would laugh with you and joke with you and, you know, give you pocket money, 10 pence a week it used to be back then. Um, and the fact that when my mother was hurtful towards me, you know, physical punishment or calling you names, if you run to your father, dad wouldn't say anything. You know, and I look at my dad and I see him as a victim. He was just this quiet figure, not able to stand up to my mother either. And that that really hurt me because I didn't want to hurt him because dad did demonstrate love in different ways. Didn't say it, but that's OK. You'd have to say it, you demonstrate it. Um, and he was kind. And I, and I remember being locked in the room as a prisoner. I was held a prisoner in my, in my house. and. You know, when my mother was pushing me into the room, looking at my dad and begging him, who stood behind my mum, please, dad, please stop her. And dad just shook his head. And, and that really hurt me. But then I see him as a victim as well. You know, it's hard for people to accept that women are perpetrators, matriarchs of these families. Not all of them, but that was my experience. Um, and my father actually had very little say. And it mm. was, only, again, it was only when my mother died that my father began to demonstrate a, a, a stronger voice towards me because he was able to. But again, in secret, we would meet. Um, right. but, but when he died, you know, he left me as one of the executives of his will and, and he put me in charge because he, he was demonstrating to me how in death, you know, he's spoken a thousand words, but he couldn't do that when he was alive because he would get shunned for that. And he also had a photo, a graduation photo of he did, in, yeah. in his room. Yeah, because my yeah. father was alive when I graduated um, and I invited him, um, hoping he would be there and he wasn't there, which which again, you know, it's again, I accepted that, but I still invited him. But when he died, you know, and I'd, I'd send photographs to my family's house of my children or significant events. Oh. 
whether they accepted them or not, I don't know. But I sent a graduation picture to my father. And um, when I had the keys to my house, I grew up in for the first time. And I walked in and walked around in the corner of the room, his bedroom. You'd miss it if you were not looking out for it, um, was my graduation picture in a frame on the wall. Wow. Yeah. And that really, again, it, it it's sad in a way because all that regret, you think about all the things you could have said to each other or shared with each other. And, you know, these strong systems of power and control linked to honour and what people think have prevented all that. Um, and, and that's why I see my father as a victim. Mm. So, just Vinder, you started you started your as, as a campaigner. You started yeah. your own uh, charity, Karma Nirvana, and mm -hmm. um, you started this back in ninety three. Mm. And you you did mention to me <laughs> on on the other podcast where you you were sat in on your kitchen table with a phone, and yeah. people were calling in. You were trying yeah. to help 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 all these women who were mm -hmm. contacting you. But mm -hmm. just to take a step back. Because we've spoken a lot about you and your sisters, but mm. this, the most surprising thing to me is that you don't just get women calling, you get men calling in as well. Yeah. And what is, what is that, what does that side look like? I mean, how, what are the stories like when men are, are forced into marriage? Well, I think what you have to remember is that where you have a family, an, an arranged marriage is different because there is the consent of two people. And therefore, you know, a forced marriage is where the consent is removed and I'm saying, no, mum, no, dad. And they're saying, you haven't got a choice. And then duress becomes a factor. That's a forced marriage. So the pressure of marriage is something that exists for both men and women. But how it looks in experience is very different for men and women. So the male callers to the helpline will call and feel the weight of pressure from the family to marry and have their arranged marriage. And they will feel a stronger sense of, you know, duty to have to go through this for the sake of the family. And we hear callers who will say, you know, my family have said to me, well, just marry for our sake and do what you want to do and still have your girlfriend down the road. And many of the male callers are gay men that call the helpline and the families find out they're gay and they force them into marriages to hide their sexuality. So we hear that as well. So the point I'm making is a woman would never be told, um, marry him for our sake, the family's sake, and then you can still go out and have your freedom and do what you want. She would never be told that. But men are, and they're still victims because they will say, we didn't want to get married, but we felt the duty of being the man of the house, carrying on the family name, you know, and the pressure to have to go through with this. So we hear those calls all the time. And if they meet somebody out of love and the family doesn't approve of them, you know, they may run away from home and then they're facing disownment too, because men also face disownment, you know. So they're the kind of cases that we hear time and time again. And I've dealt mm. with male suicides as well, where they have been driv driven to commit suicide. What is the, the ratio like for, for men to women who, who, call, who call the helpline? Um, for men, it was when I was, I mean, we reconstituted ourselves as Carmen of Honour in 2008 to support men because men were calling and nationally there was nowhere to refer. So um, for Carmen of Honor, not dissimilar to the government's forced marriage unit, it's around 25% of the callers are men. Wow. And, when and it's you increasing. First start, yeah. Sorry, just a minute. I just wanted to ask you that when you first started in 93 on your kitchen yeah. table, yeah. how many phone calls were you getting a day or a month? And were you surprised with, with the influx of calls coming in? Well, actually, in 93 to, oh gosh, 96, I could not get more than one or two people, you know, and when I say people, I'm talking about, I would go everywhere. I'd go to GP practice, I'd go to um, schools, I'd go to police, social workers to tell them about these issues. And I couldn't get more than one or two people to hear what I had to say. So so how am I going to access those who are affected if I can't reach them? That was a big issue. So initially there were no calls, actually, from victim callers. And that's when I became a Keep Fit instructor. And I trained myself in Keep Fit. I became an instructor. You know, they used to do step classes, Keep Fit classes, yoga classes. And I would only do my classes at the Indian Community Centre, the Pakistan Community Centre, 
the Hindu community centre where Asian women would come. And I used to black out the windows and they used to have permission to come. And I used to get about, it started off 10 women, 30 women, then 60 women at a time. They were so busy. And at the end of each class, I would tell them about this charity that I founded. And I, it, and I used to call it a women's health charity because women were allowed to talk about health. So it would be about PMT, breast cancer, breast awareness, you know, HRT, all those things. And then I would do small groups. And once I got them in there, I would start sharing my experiences of forced marriage, Rubina's experiences. Then slowly over time, these women started to disclose to me domestic abuse, forced marriages. And that's how it's the word started to get out. And I remember the very first event I ever did, it was called the Women's Health Day in 1996. And there were queues of women, of which 90% were South Asian women that came, about 300 women. And we were talking about all the real serious issues, honour abuse, domestic abuse. Yeah, we talked about PMT and things like that. But the point is... Just on the side. Just on the side. (laughs) Well, yeah, because it was a women's... It was badged a women's health project. But it was was the way I was trying to gain access. And then that was it. Um, The callers started to come in. And I used to have volunteers and they'd say to me on the helpline, nobody ever calls. You know, we probably get one call a month. And I used to say to them, you have to believe they are out there. They just don't know that we are here. So over time, the calls started to flood in, you know, from one call a month to 10 to 20 to 100. Since its inception, it's received over 98,000 calls. You know, now it's around 900 contacts a month at Carmel of Honor. So, yeah, it's incredible. And some people forget the work initially to get that to that yeah, level. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, you, you worked on a, I mean, that decision you made at the age of 16 mm. created a life where you were making change on, on a national level and to some extent a global level as well. Yeah. And you've been working with, with policies as well and to make yeah. that, those changes within the country. Yeah. And, you know, I've, I've been doing the same with my husband with with COVID and how we've been yeah. trying to protect healthcare workers, especially those from ethnic minority groups, because sure. those are the ones who are always forgotten. Sure. And trust me, just been the, the number of times we've gone back and forth, back and forth, yeah. back and forth yeah. is, is endless. It's yeah. just, you know, it, it feels like the system wants to tire you out. Yeah. So you say, OK, look, forget it. There's no point. Yeah. How difficult was it for you to make a change on a national level? Regarding a concept that was affecting a minority group, especially? Oh, it was really difficult because, you know, there's the people's denial is one thing. People's genuine ignorance to the issue is another thing. You know, we can understand that because they're not educated in this. Um, And the fact that here I was, somebody born in England... And I'm advocating an issue that sounds very barbaric, couldn't possibly be happening Mm. in Britain. So you would get people go, no, 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 that happens over there somewhere in that country, you know, not here in England. And I would say, but I am the the evidence. Well, show us, then they they tell you to prove it, show us the statistics. Well, there isn't statistics, but I know it's happening. And I'm one statistic. This was before I had had the evidence. So, you know... You just have to keep on being persistent. You, you know, I learned, you know, people's responses and I just persisted and persisted. And my voice, I wouldn't let them drown it. I'd learned to walk around obstacles instead of into them. I got to the point where, you know, you can get really frustrated and quite angry as well as a campaigner when you're advocating an issue because somebody's not getting it. And you have to accept to agree to disagree. They're where they are. But your mission is still as important and you just keep going until somebody does listen, you know. And for me, I have to say, um, where people didn't listen, my conviction became greater. I didn't allow that to allow me to become Mm. despondent. Um, It was it was it became personal in a sense. (laughs) Because because I because then you start thinking about the inequalities you start thinking about the playing field as not being level. You start thinking about, well, taxes are black and white and Asian. You know, we all pay for these services. You know, you start shifting the way you're advocating the issue. 
And then you start looking at policies where there are gaps in policies and provisions. So, for example, for us, affected by child and forced marriage, there's ne- there was never a law, you know. Mm. Um, and the laws that exist don't speak to our experience, kidnap, rape, abduction, whatever. So there, it was clearly, for me, that there needed to be a law for victims to own it as a crime, to own the inequality that exists here in this big space. Because every single one of us should be entitled to have the right to choose who we want to marry. And then you look at the ramifications on people because of forced marriage. Well, the right to an education, the right to reproductive health, all those things. So you start speaking in a language where people will listen and understand, if that Mm. makes sense. Yeah. Just wonder, you've created a lot of change outside your your life and you've Mm. helped so many people overcome so many you know big obstacles and you know to some extent you have saved the lives of many men and women but on a more personal note before we end end this show Mm. what is your relationship like now with with your family and I mean like your brothers and sisters do you have any contact with them or um is it just how it was 20 years ago so remember I have been disowned for 40 years now And in that time, I've had secret relationships with some of my family. But as it stands, over the last 23 years, and I say that because my son is 23 and that's how I know it for sure, um, I've not had any communication with my family. And recently, when COVID started, um, in March this year, I said to my daughter, Natasha, She's the eldest, and Natasha's 34. I said, you know, I'm I'm really thinking about my family in terms of how are they and are they safe during this time. So in my own mind, and sometimes when you're disowned, you what you have to remember is we never hear about deaths, we never hear about births, we don't celebrate birthdays of family members. I know all their dates, we don't celebrate the Wali. There's no to do that with or Christmas. But at this time in COVID, I know that many people are at risk. And, you know, I started to think about, is my fa- is my brother alive? Or how are my sisters and et cetera? So Natasha said to me, Mum, if you want, my youngest sister, younger than me, is on Facebook and I'll send her a message and just say, look, Mum's feeling this at the moment at this time, you know, just wants to know that you're okay and everybody's okay in the family if you want me to send that mum I will and I said yes okay um for the first time so Natasha did that and she sent a private message and my sister got back to her immediately and I I was asking my daughter for the next few days you know have you heard anything have you heard anything and she kept saying oh mum no but I knew she had and I said look Natasha whatever you say to me don't worry about me so my daughter wanted to hurt my feelings and I, I reassured her that it was it was okay to tell me because, you know, she knows that when my, she's been with me before, um, when we've walked down the road in Derby and my family have seen me and they cross the road and they physically ignore me. The days of mum going home and crying herself to sleep have gone, you know, you can tell me. So she said, yes, she says, mum, she did get back to me. This is my younger sister. And she said, to tell your mother from all of us, that means on behalf of the family, that that ship sailed a long time ago and tell her not to bother us. So, you know, Natasha told me this and in a sense it just, you know, there's been times when my family have reinforced my disownment and I've been really hurt by it. But actually, you know, I was doing the human thing and I I tend to honour how I feel. That's how I've tried to live my life because... We were never taught that, you know, we were taught to hide how we feel, you know, to be Mm. silent. Um, And I just thought, okay, I know where I stand still. Not that I needed a reminder, but I was honouring how I felt during this time in COVID in that I just wanted to make sure they were okay. Um, So the clear message was to stay away. Nothing's changed, basically. (laughs) Why do you why do you think those feelings are not reciprocated just when they're because I mean, I understand they they probably led a different life to you after the age of. 16 when you ran away but I also feel that with with time generations have moved on and there must be that this doesn't seem to be any sort of understanding whatsoever or 
um, love for for their sister who who left home for for from mm. what I can see very good reasons. But you know, I'm I, I can't really explain why, and I try not to give too much energy to why. But you know, even when I published mm. my my first book, Shame, you know, they protested and they sent letters to my editor and called me a liar and were threatening to sue me for libel if I published the book. And you know, I'm I'm used to that. And there's been threats in the past, um, you know, and threats to kill. So, you know, I don't, all I can say is, I mean, and that sister is British born, remember? So she's not of a generation of a long time ago. Yes, I expect better, but, you know, disappointments are born out of expectations. I have to let that go because I own it how I felt and I'm used to these, moments of rejection but I handle them differently now you know it's interesting because I I'd like as I, as you get older you know I'm in my 50s now middle 50s and you know you go to your GP and you're almost like an adopted child because I have no family history you know and I have sisters wow. alive I don't know if they have cancer or how they are and you know I have no family tree to refer to and I'd love to be able to say you know, when did you start your menopause or, or you know, I've, I've heard one of my sisters has, has had cancer, but I don't know what does it mean for me in terms of prevention. Do you see what mm. I mean? Yeah. So, so I've learned to live my life um, accommodating all these things because what it does for me is it reinforces my decision at 16, which I fundamentally do not regret at all. And, you know, I have to remind myself of, that was your choice and the, this is the life you're living now because of that choice. Mm. And then I look at my children and their freedom and independence and they're educated and my grandchildren who will never inherit that legacy of abuse. So I'm not going to feel sorry for myself and I never want anybody to pity me because I get to live a free life and so do they. And that matters more. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for for sharing your story, just been there. I, I appreciate your, your time and I can't wait for this next Hopefully, fingers crossed, book that might come out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and thank, uh, you. thank you so much again, Jasminder. I'm sorry I have to rush off now because I can hear my three month old screaming. So oh, bless I think you. I need to head back to that. Yeah.